uh, I was in Mexico with the CIA in the 60s. And uh, they had a vast operation going there. And especially in their um, penetrations and work with the Mexican security services. And in fact, it started with the president uh, in Mexico, our operations. A very close relationship with three successive presidents, Lopez Mateos, Diaz Ortaz. Um, when it comes to Mexico and this, um, this Zapatista movement, there's not a doubt in my mind that they're in Chiapas. They've been there since day one, I'm sure. The National Intelligence Service, known as SIN, which the CIA, <laughs> which the CIA established in 86 or 87, as a national service to be used against the narcotics trade coming through Haiti and the Caribbean and that area, which in fact turned into a narcotics dealing organization, as they always do or often do. Afghanistan is not an Arab country, but they had a lot of volunteers, uh, Islamic fundamentalists from the Arab countries, uh. who went as volunteers to fight. In Afghanistan, they were, they, they, they were volunteers from Algeria, from Morocco, from all of North Africa, Egypt too, Sudan and uh, other Arab countries, and they went there as volunteers, and they fought. Uh, first, they were trained in, um, in how to handle the weapons and so forth uh, by, in these camps provided by the CIA. And uh, then they saw action on the front lines. Well, when it was over, these, uh, they're called Afghanis in their home countries because they'd gone off oh. to, as volunteers, even though they're from Arab countries. So these Afghanis, uh, so-called Afghanis, they went back and then they started to foment fundamentalist revolution in their own country. So you see what's happening in Egypt or in Algeria right now. This Algerian civil war has oh, yeah. taken 30, 35,000 lives, they say. But this is being run and some of the main forces there have served in Afghanistan uh, uh, with the meal ticket from the CIA and the training and so forth. Uh, same thing in Egypt with the um, uh, so-called Islamic group there. And of these people who were tried in New York, uh, f on the two cases, you know, one the World Trade Center bombing and the other the conspiracy trial for the tunnels in the, you know. Uh, I, I think half of those were trained in Afghanistan. Phil A.G. was a CIA officer for 12 years, serving mainly in Latin America. He quit the agency and wrote his bestseller Inside the Company. He will share his experiences and insights with us right now on Alternative Views. This is a program I've been wanting to do on Alternative Views for 17 years, and that is have an interview with former CIA officer Phil Agee. Now, we have had some uh, programs with Phil uh, that you have seen, uh, some speeches that he has given that we've had copies of and have presented them to you, and on the documentary on company business, but this is our first chance to actually talk with him in person. Phil was in the CIA for 12 years and then quit after he saw what the CIA was actually doing, all the terrible things doing, in the areas where he was working particularly in Ecuador, Mexico, and Uruguay. He resigned in 1969 to write his first big book, Inside the Company, or CIA Diary. Since then, he's written uh, five books, the last one being On the Run, which tells about his experiences after he got out of the CIA, when he was in Europe and trying to write his book, and the CIA was hounding him from country to country, doing everything it could to uh, keep him from writing this book. Well, Phil, we're so pleased that uh, you can finally uh, be with us. I'm very happy to be here. Very happy to be here. Uh, 
You've had an, such an association with the CIA, both positive and negative, for so many years. Uh, let's start out by talking about where the CIA is today. They say they want to do intelligence gathering on economic subjects rather than uh, political, et cetera, like they had in the past. What do you think about that? Well, I think that that's uh, a normal activity. Uh, they've been doing that since the beginning. To speak of it as something new is uh, really inaccurate. Uh, in this context of, of all this talk about economic and financial and commercial intelligence collection as a new role for the agency, I um, got out a document which was sent to me anonymously in 1976, 20 years ago practically. And this document was, uh, was the um, list of the what they call key intelligence questions for 1975 in this very field economic, commercial, financial intelligence, also high-tech uh, developments, and all in the developed countries, all in allies like the NATO allies and Japan. And um, this is a, was an innovation of William Colby when he came into the CIA in 1973. He tried to systematize and organi organize the foreign intelligence collection process. And for 1975, uh, there were, I think, 69 key intelligence questions. And these are actually uh, uh, questions uh, with some detail, and then there's a whole discussion of them that follows from 1 to 69. But these were only, on this document, there were only the, uh, the nine which deal with economic and commercial and financial matters. And uh, I got at that out, and, and it calls for great, great detail on all of these matters, including the negotiating positions, the fallback positions on such uh, negotiations as the uh, General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, now the WTO. Um, and all of it uh, was, in, in its most important uh, parts, spying on allies. Uh, and the um, State Department was supposed to get this type of information. The CIA would get it, get it in its way, secretly, or through some kind of technical means, or through agents. And um, so I just uh, point that document out. That's 20 years ago. And they were doing it for 20 years before that. I would assume then they would turn this information over to the corporations, the multinational corporations? Uh, that I can't be sure of. Uh, they would uh, send it in, of course, to the analysts, and they would then be preparing reports for use within the government, uh, in the Commerce Department, you know, and in, uh, within the White House and the National Security Council and, and its staff. Uh, but the decision to turn it over to commercial companies or multinationals is something which... Um, um, I, I can't really say that they did that then, but we did help the multinationals uh, in different ways from time to time to time. My very first job in the CIA after the training program was to, uh, I was assigned to the Latin American division, to the Venezuela desk, and my job, it was, it was so boring, uh, <laughs> I had to do name checks. And a name check is where you get a name from, in this case, Caracas, our office in Caracas in the embassy. And uh, you, um, you make a request for all the records on this particular person from the Records Integration Division, or RID. That's where the files were. And um, then you were looking for anything uh, negative, politically negative, in other words, or derogatory. It happened that these lists of names that I was getting uh, every week uh, were given to us in Caracas by the Chief of Security of Creole Petroleum. <laughs> and Creole Petroleum, you know, was the largest uh, overseas subsidiary of Ex uh, ESSO, or now Exxon, of Standard Oil of New Jersey, in yeah. other words. And so we were performing this um, security check in order th uh, to help them keep political undesirables out of employment, because these were people who were prospective employees for Creole. And so we were doing these checks on Venezuelans, actually, and uh, uh, serving the interests of of, um, of this um, enormous um, Standard Oil, Exxon, Exesso uh, subsidiary abroad. This is one example, um, and uh, I could tell you, uh, when I got uh, out of that job, I was very happy because it's just boring, as you can imagine, <laughs> to try to go through all these different records and look for something that might be derogatory and then have to write it back. And, and uh, the first name I got was Jose Diaz. Uh, and didn't even have a date of birth, so you can imagine how many, oh, how many files I had on Jose Diaz. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the most common like name John in Smith, life, right? of course. Yeah. It was, it was. Well, this is uh, <laughs> when they say they're going to start doing uh, economic intelligence now and uh, helping out the uh, quote 
U.S., unquote, corporations. They've really been doing that all along. It's just kind of taking the mask off of it because everywhere they have, the CIA has actually been making the, that particular country safe and profitable for the multinational oh, yes. corporations and local elites. Yes, everything uh, goes back to that. And as a matter of fact, um, this intervention abroad for stability for the optimum operating conditions for U.S.-based multinationals is something that predates even um, certainly World War II. And um, in some respects, you could say it even predates the Bolshevik Revolution because it's more than 100 years now that, that um, the leadership in this country has understood that there's no way to preserve the system in this country without foreign markets for surplus production, without foreign labor, cheap labor, and without the cheapest possible natu nat uh, national re uh, natural resources. And uh, this is something which had been going on for 100 years um, um, uh, all through the Cold War. And so it is something that's going to continue for the future. But in this uh, economic and um, commercial area, there have been two cases this year uh, of operations that went bad. Uh, one was in France in February when the French government um, caught the CIA trying to recruit people in the French government for secret information on French negotiating positions within the World Trade Organization co um, context. And they, uh, they ordered five CIA people out of the country. That was the news at that time in February. Four of them, including the chief of station, uh, were in the embassy undercover as diplomats, you know. And then there was a fifth one, a woman who was outside the embassy. She was under some non-official cover. Uh, I don't know what that was, but uh, that was the news at that time. And then it came, comes out much later, just a few weeks ago, that as a result of this and of the, of the um, reaction of the French government, the strong reaction to this attempt to penetrate their government, uh, the whole CIA operation in Paris, in France, was shut down including whatever they were doing against international terrorism, the narcotics trade, and so forth. Uh, that's one case that went bad on them this year. Uh, another one that went bad just uh, a few weeks ago was the uh, leakage to the press, which was in f and eventually confirmed. It's true. The CIA was spying on the Japanese negotiators last summer in the trade, uh, the auto talks, um, you know, how we're trying to get into their market and so forth. And the CIA was um, monitoring the communications, I believe, of the Japanese negotiators and the appropriate uh, ministry, and also the companies themselves, so that our side, that's um, um, the um, Mickey Cantor side, would um, have a better knowledge of what they would accept and what they wouldn't accept. And so this has mm -hmm. soured relations with Japan also. So when you get into this area of, of spying on your allies, uh, you, you're asking for a lot of trouble. And whether they give that to the companies or not, um, it's difficult to say. I, I can't tell you. Of course, they've been doing this type, we talk about the Japanese, they've been doing that type of, uh, of monitoring of communications and uh, for, for years, for decades. This is nothing new. I guess it just now came out. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, it, as I mentioned, it went, goes back at least 20 years and then 20 mm -hmm. years before that. But one area that ought not to be forgotten is Cuba, because there is a 35-year economic blockade going right. against Cuba still. And there are those people who are trying to uh, intensify this and broaden it still more now. Um, the CIA, without the slightest doubt, has the requirement in every uh, country to report on any possible trade deals that Cuba may be interested in making or investment in Cuba now that the country has opened up. And the CIA has got to collect this information so that measures can be taken to to sabotage these possible um, deals of interest and benefit to Cuba. I was there last year and uh, I was in a meeting uh, being addressed by Roberto Robaina. He is the foreign minister, very young, hip guy. And uh, he was telling us that of every 10 possible deals they have for investment in Cuba or for trade, and, um, the United States is able to uh, squash nine. And so they know perfectly well that every move they make as they go around the world uh, in, uh, in trade negotiations or in seeking investment for whatever in Cuba, uh, they are being followed and watched under a microscope so that uh, some measure can be taken. It could be the ambassador with the local government. It could be any way they can uh, approach the person and put the pressure on. Uh, there's a good example of this, for example. 
Uh, the Soviets built a, a large petroleum refinery uh, very near Cienfuegos, which is the main city on the south coast. Um, this was never put into operation before the collapse of the Soviet Union, and um, then there, were, there was a, uh, a diminution in trade. And the Cubans finally convinced or made a deal with the Ecuadorians, who, which are uh, one of the principal exporting countries, and they were to uh, bring the petroleum from Ecuador to Cuba, to this refinery, refine the products and re-export, leaving behind a certain amount of, of, of production to pay for the use of the refinery. This was going to be a great deal for Cuba because they have a, a, an energy, energy crisis uh, mm -hmm. that's terrible. The United States was able to put the fist down on Ecuador and it fell through. So the Cubans made a deal with the Venezuelans because eventually, you know, they, they nationalized Creole and mm -hmm. it's all a national industry now. Uh, the Venezuelans then were going to bring the petroleum to this refinery and re-export, leaving surplus production behind for the Cubans. The same thing happened. Bang. The, Cub the Venezuelans had to withdraw. So the Cubans went to the Mexicans, and the Mexicans resisted. And now they are putting it into operation. So uh, it's not hopeless, but you see how the United States mm -hmm. is going around in these uh, areas of, of economics and of trade and of commerce uh, and finance to try to make the Cuban people suffer as much as they can. And this is affecting, in a drastic way, very young children and infants and also the older, in other words, the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And it is, a, it is a, a, an eternal shame on the United States, in my opinion, that we would do such a thing to an entire country just because we don't like the system, just because they won't come under our protection, mm -hmm. basically. It's a, it's a kind of a mafia uh, attitude, and it has been that way since Eisenhower. Well, that's capitalism. <laughs> well, it's also the United States and uh, yeah. our tradition of being very nervous when we don't control something. And when a country like Cuba slips out from under our control after we had ruled it practically as a neo-colony or a protectorate um, for 59 years or so, uh, then it makes people nervous because they know that if the Cubans are successful in their example, of being able to provide, as a poor country, the best medical care in the third world to the whole population, because it's an inclusionary, inclusionary system. It's not like we have here, where you have this huge bulk of the population, you know, marginalized. Um, but there, if everybody can have adequate medical care, if the schooling is adequate for all, and remember, Cuba has more doctors and more teachers per capita than any country in the world and they have succeeded in these areas, and it's all state-supported, um, which means people don't have to put money out for, for the medical care or for um, its... In, they, they, of course, pay the cost indirectly as a whole society, but they don't have to pay the bill in the mm -hmm. hospital and so forth. And so that cannot be allowed to stand. It's a very bad example for the United States and for all the third world people in the United States. Uh, after all, we're, we're becoming a third world country very fast, if not... A, already you know. not already yeah. and uh, so there is a, a very large mass of people out there who can look at Cuba and say La, well if they can do it uh, and on a per capita income of two thousand two thousand five hundred dollars a year where ours is twenty two thousand five hundred dollars a year what's wrong with what's wrong with our system I mean maybe we ought to consider an alternative that's why Nicaragua Sandinista in Nicaragua had to be destroyed Exactly. They were a bad example, and that's why Grenada had to be destroyed, because mm -hmm. any um, movement that comes to power with the idea of providing for all the people and of escaping the control of the United States and its uh, economy, let's say the corporations and so forth, then that is bad news here in the United States in the upper uh, circles of power and influence. And so uh, in Nicaragua, uh, I watched it from the very beginning. I was often there, and um, it, was, it was a very sad sight to see the hopes at the beginning and the, the euphoria with the overthrow of this U.S.-installed dictatorship from the 30s on, Somoza, and all the hopes for expanding education and the literacy program they adopted right at the beginning. It's similar to what the Cubans did. Mm -hmm. Health as well. Health as well. All of those things. Cuban doctors were in there. Uh, they were setting up clinics, clinics all over. The international solidarity movement was, was just uh, tremendous for Nicaragua. 
in those early years. And naturally, the United States could not let that mm -hmm. stand. And the economic system was working. They had the uh, uh, highest, uh, greatest expansion of, uh, uh, of their uh, national, gross national product of any country in the Western Hemisphere at that time. That's right. That was in the early years. But then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the CIA started to reorganize using Argentine military officers who had worked in this um, really um, I, it's, you can, it's hard to find words for the uh, the Argentines, you know, in the 70s, uh, the oh. dirty war there. But these military people from Argentina were taken by the CIA, put to work in Honduras, reorganizing the remnants of the of the Somoza National Guard, and then it, it became a a huge terrorist operation. And um, as a matter of fact, at the by the end, when when the killing was was uh, stopping in the late 1980s, um, they had killed something like 30. 5,000 people, and that's 1% of the population of Nicaragua. Uh, the comparable figure for the United States would be, what, 2.5 2. million people killed over an eight, nine-year period. I mean, that's more than were killed in all the wars that the United States ever fought. I checked it out once, and uh, it, it, it would be a catastrophe. Can you imagine if something happened to this country where 2.5 million people were killed? Well, it means in Nicaragua there's not a family that was untouched. I mean. Uh, and, and they have a huge number of amputees now in, in Nicaragua and a very large program for getting um, uh, prosthetics for these people because of the landmines that the countries put around. And they're still, they don't, you know, they still haven't gotten them all out of the ground. Same thing happened in Angola. Exactly. Angola's got the very same problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, well, it's where the CIA goes. Uh, if it happens in one place, it's going to happen in another. Mm -hmm. uh, the CIA uh, more or less intimates that, well, they're out of the covert action business anymore. But I read recently where they're down in Chiapas helping the government fight the rebels there. There's not a doubt in my mind that they're in Chiapas. They've been there since day one, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, Mexico is just too important to the United States to leave it to the Mexicans. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> and yeah. um, uh, I was in Mexico with the CIA in the 60s. And uh, they had a vast operation going there, and especially in their um, penetrations and work with the Mexican security services. And in fact, it started with the president uh, in Mexico, our operations. A very close relationship with three successive presidents, Lopez Mateos, Diaz Ortaz. Um, when it comes to Mexico and this, um, this Zapatista movement, what they have to worry about, I think, is not just the armed movement in Chiapas of these uh, this armed force uh, of uh, the EZLN, but as an inspiration, they uh, they triggered the development of a huge uh, support network, uh, popular movement all over the country, which has come together to support their demands. And the demands are are really not outrageous at all. <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, they're not outrageous. <laughs> and the Zapatistas themselves, I could not believe this, that they say we do not want power. I mean, that's the first guerrilla organization, I think, that has ever said that. <laughs> the idea always was to take power and then I impose or establish uh, or reorganize, do whatever you want to do. But uh, they say, no, we just want to have democracy in this country. And we want to get the uh, PRI out. And uh, the PRI is, of course, is so unpopular now, it's, it's, it's carrying on through its, its uh, patronage uh, system, you know, that's been in, in, in mm -hmm. power for a long time. Uh, so in Mexico, I think they have a much bigger problem than just the armed movement uh, in Chiapas. But it has spread all over the country, and nobody can tell where this is going to lead. Uh, the Zapatistas, you know, had this, in, this referendum back in August and September. And they had it not only in Mexico. This was a referendum on a number of questions, on the direction in which the people would like to see the country move and how they would like to see the Zapatistas themselves uh, develop. Uh, whether they should uh, convert themselves into a, uh, not, um, a an independent political movement. Uh, and they had international people. I voted in the thing, too, because I'm sitting over there in Germany reading every day through my computer the latest uh, happenings in Chiapas and all over Mexico. And so I'm naturally very interested. I voted uh, <laughs> on all these questions. There are a whole series of questions. And uh, people, I think they had uh, 80 or 100,000 people outside Mexico who took part in this referendum. And there were several million in Mexico who... who, who what did they do, send out questionnaires to people all around the country? Well, in, in, in my case, uh, all the questions came on, uh, all, well, through on the, the computer, computer. Uh, through the net. And I sent my vote back <laughs> through the net. And uh, in Mexico, they organized um, tables all over the country. Oh. And uh, people went and, and voted uh, on their 
preferences according to this list of questions. So uh, you can be very sure that the CIA is in there in a very big way. I imagine they're in there with special forces of the United States Army um, right in Chiapas. They are doing communications monitoring, I'm sure, of all the uh, transmissions of the Zapatistas and uh, monitoring the people who come and go. You know, the Mexican Army has tried to make, put a ring around uh, uh, the area controlled by the, the EZLN. And it's a, it's a very fascinating scene to watch. But when you talk about, going back to your comment about covert action in the um, 1990s, um, there are some very interesting things that have come out. For example, even though the Cold War is over, that does not mean that the United States is going to settle for democracy in any particular country. They never have. And uh, the litany is quite long, you know, starting from the 50s, uh, of democratic processes. What is accepted here as legitimate electoral process and pluralistic political parties and so forth. When that goes against U.S. interests, they don't, don't, kill, they don't care. I mean, it's not a matter of principle for them. The principle is what's good for us. You know, what's, not, that what's that famous remark that Kissinger made about uh, the situation in Chile? That, uh, uh, oh, we shouldn't stand by uh, because of the um, irresponsibility of the Chilean people. <laughs> and at the same time, Zen Nixon was uh, telling the CIA to make the Chilean economy scream. Yeah. But uh, what has happened now in the 1990s is that, um, in 1990, Bulgaria. The Bulgarian Communist Party, the former communists, they renamed themselves as the Bulgarian Socialist Party. And they won the 1990 elections uh, in the sense that they took 211 of the 400 seats in the parliament. Do you think that uh, the United States accepted that? All these international observers were there from Western Europe and other places, and they all said this was absolutely free and fair. There was no fraud at all that we could detect. But the United States didn't accept that. And so nowadays, instead of having just the CIA going around behind the scenes and trying to manipulate the process secretly by inserting money here and instructions there and so forth, they have now a sidekick, which is this National Endowment for Democracy, oh, yeah. NED. Yeah. And uh, this organization dates from 1967. A lot of people don't realize because it was just established in, the, I think, 83 uh, or so. But the idea uh, emerged from a series of scandalous revelations in 1967, the worst ones to that point, to hit the CIA. And I was um, in headquarters at the time that these uh, scandals broke and the gloom there was something you could, you could touch almost. Because what happened was uh, the, the long-running CIA's control and manipulation of the international program of the National Students Association in this country, which was the national organization of university students, uh, came out. It was revealed. Uh, and that led to revelations of a lot of other CIA operations because they were using the same bogus and real foundations to channel money into all these different or overseas organizations. And I remember very well that Time Magazine at the time, or Newsweek, I think it was Time, uh, they published a wheel uh, oh, yeah. with all these spokes going out. And the CIA was at the center, and then halfway out were all these, these, corporate, uh, these um, foundations uh, American organizations, and then out at the end were the uh, foreign groups that got the money and the instructions, naturally. They don't give, give away money without being sure that it's spent the way they want it spent. And so um, uh, this was a catastrophe for the CIA. And the next month or the month after that, this started in February of 67, and then by April, I think it was, Dante Fashel, the congressman from Florida, was proposing the establishment of a, an open system to finance these overseas organizations. And we're talking about uh, some government organizations abroad, some political parties, uh, some media uh, organizations, uh, youth organizations and student organizations, all these kinds of, of so-called pluralist organizations, when in fact they weren't really free organizations for, because to the degree that they take money and instructions from the CIA, to that degree they're not free at all, right? But anyway, Fashel came up with this idea, but nothing, it didn't go anywhere because the so-called consensus between the two parties had broken down over Vietnam. And so it wasn't until the early 80s when Reagan made his speech in the House of Commons about the democracy project worldwide that this began to take on steam again. And uh, finally, they decided to copy the German example. Uh, each of the major German political parties has a foundation which is financed by the German government. 
uh, before it was West Germany, now the whole country. And, um, uh, for example, the uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung is the um, SPD, or the Social Democratic Party's um, um, foundation. And they finance projects all over the place. And for years in the 50s and 60s, and I would guess even into the 70s, in fact, I know into the 70s, and even to the uh, early 80s, the CIA was channeling money through these German foundations abroad. For example, some money, uh, a lot of money, I think it was a million dollars or more, uh, but I'm, I'm a little hazy on the amount. But anyway, it went through the, it was CIA money who, which went through the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, that's the Christian Democratic Union. It went from there to Evepo, which is um, a foundation of the um, COPE, the Christian Democrats in Venezuela. Oh. And from there, it went to the Christian Democrats in El Salvador, to Duarte, for use in the elections, I've forgotten which year, maybe 84 or something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, it was traced. Some journalists did this. And um, so that is the way they would use these German foundations in the past. So now we've got our own. We don't have to use the Germans unless we really want to anymore. Because in 1984, uh, we established this National Endowment for Democracy, which is nothing but a mega conduit. And the millions or the tens of millions that uh, are set aside for the meddling in the internal affairs of other countries goes to this conduit. It's like a bank account or something. But they have a board of directors and they uh, do reports and stuff like that. <laughs> but then it goes from there to one of four uh, private foundations. Uh, one of the Democratic Party, one the Republican Party, or two, three the AFL-CIO, and four the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce. These groups then uh, pass it out to recipients uh, in foreign countries. And in the Nicaraguan elections of 1990, I believe the figure was something like 12.5 million that went from the National Endowment for Democracy through these conduits to the UNO political movement there. Uh, it was the party, the coalition, you know, of UNO, which is the most ungodly coalition uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. you can ever imagine. Everything from communists all the way That's to right. Samosistas. That's right. And uh, then they had a trade front, trade union front, mm -hmm. uh, which also received money. And then they had this civic association. Civic association, I think they call it Via Civica there. Um, that's, a, that's an old, old uh, technique of the CIA is to establish a, 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 a type of civic organization which will be involved in monitoring elections and things like that. And the first one that I know of was Namfrel in um, the Philippines. They established that one around 1950-51 as part of the counterinsurgency against the Hux, uh, the, um, the uh, guerrilla movement of the time, because we wanted to have a vehicle for electing our man president of the Philippines. And we did it through this organization, NANFRO. NANFRO stands for National Association for Free Elections, I think. <laughs> free. And, uh, yeah, free elections, when we were financing the thing. <laughs> and um, NANFRO was very successful. And uh, our man, uh, Ramon Magsaysay, was elected president, I think it was 70, 52, 53. And unfortunately, he was killed in a plane crash, 57. And so then we switched to Marcos and various other uh, people like that. But NANFRO never, never uh, faded away. And in 1986, remember the elections of 1986, which Marcos tried to steal? Well, NAMFRO was alive and well. And they were the ones who denounced the fraud by Marcos. And they then inspired the movement of people power, which forced him to resign and brought Cory Aquino in as president. So NAMFRO was alive and well. They tried to copy it in Panama. They sent the president of the Chamber of Commerce in the early 80s, um, or 84 or there, more or less, in preparation for the 87 elections, I think it was. They sent him out to Panama to study the way NAMFRO worked. So he could come back to Panama and establish another one there. And so he did. In Panama, it was called Cruzada Civica, or Civic Crusade. And um, this was what was used against the Noriega forces in the streets. It became a what they call Rabi Blanca there, um, you know, the, the upper-class white people in Panama. It was one of those organizations. But they did take to the streets, and um, you can remember the, the, uh, the pictures on the covers of the magazines, you know, when they had the riots, and, um, and Noriega was not overthrown then. But they tried everything in Panama. The CIA was running candidates of its own uh, all through the 1980s, trying to get Noriega out. Maybe not all through the 80s. No, they, his, his utility ended about 86, 87. Because he was working with the CIA. Yes, and doing yes. It was important for the Contra operation, operation in, um, in Nicaragua. But by 87, everybody knew that the Contras were not going to do anything. They weren't going anywhere militarily. 
And uh, Noriega's importance was in allowing Panama to be used for training them and also for resupply. But that was over by 87, and that's when the efforts began to, to get him aside, leading to the invasion in 89. But uh, they were uh, up to here in Panamanian politics, and I'm sure they are, using these different types of organizations. So the covert action operations go on. And as a matter of fact, in, um, not only in, Bolivia, uh, in uh, Bulgaria did they overturn this government. I didn't even finish that story, but what happened is all this money from National Endowment for Democracy went in, and they fomented student strikes and demonstrations, trade union strikes, uh, massive street protests, and uh, not only was the money put in by the National Endowment for Democracy, but also pa Paul Weyrich's um, Free Congress Foundation. Uh, got involved. And this is part of the Christian right, you know. He's right. the man who runs all these different organizations out of the same address in Washington, D.C. And uh, this Free Congress Foundation also got going in there, uh, in, I guess in coordination with what the CIA was doing, what NED was do doing, and, and so forth. And so the elections were in June. Uh, the communists had, or the former communists had won. By the end of November, they were out because they made the country ungovernable. 1991, they did the same thing in Albania. They had elections there. Free, fair, no fraud, former communists won. The United States got in there through these different organizations and the CIA, naturally, and they made Albania ungovernable. Chile, same thing. Same, Chile, same thing. Brazil in the early 60s, mm -hmm. same thing. We, did, I did this, we were doing the same thing when I was in Ecuador. In fact, we had two coups, uh, two um, unconstitutional changes of government when I was there, and uh, they were largely due to what we were doing. And by the time I left, uh, after three years, we had what we wanted, a four-man military dictatorship that was carrying on a very strong repression against the left. What's the situation in Haiti now? That's a little bit different situation than, uh, say, Nicaragua was. Well, Haiti is another example of uh, 1990s operations. Um, Aristide, you know, elected with two-thirds of the vote in 1990, takes office in early 1991. He's thrown out in September. Uh, and there's strong, strong evidence that the CIA was, was pushing this. Because Aristide is not the sort of man they are f comfortable dealing with, you know. No, he wants to elevate the uh, level of, uh, of the common people, ordinary people, just yeah. like in Nicaragua. Exactly. He comes from uh, liberation theology, and that's always made the United States quite nervous. Yes. Because uh, in 1968, at the um, Medellin Bishops' Conference, you know, they made this prefer what they called a preferential option for the poor. And that was a historical turning point for the Catholic Church in Latin America. I mean, they'd already been doing very good things, certain people, you know, some of the Jesuits, some of the others, uh, and also doing awful things, like in the past, associating themselves with the oligarchies and so forth. But 68, and this uh, decision by the Bishops' Conference was really a major, major event. And the liberation theology moved forward very fast after that through the Christian-based communities, you know, that they established all over Latin America. And these people were uh, dedicated to achieving social justice one way or another. And Aristide comes from that tradition. So uh, anything like that makes people nervous because uh, it means instability. And I remember so well all those years I was down there working with the CIA in Latin America, if there was one, one thing we wanted and was our goal was stability. And just as important, I guess you could say the second one is control. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not possible when you get uh, a movement which is clamoring for reform. And Aristide was trying to help the poor of Haiti and reorganize the society. That was his program uh, along the lines of social justice and so forth. And so when that happens, it makes the United States very nervous and they couldn't have him. And so they had to ask, they had to ask the generals to take over. And not only did they ask them to take over, but uh, there, uh, there's any number of reports, and I believe them, that the CIA was paying these generals uh, running the military dictatorship over that three-year period who, that killed four or 5,000 people. And uh, I don't know if you've been following Alan Nairn's reporting in The Nation on Haiti, but he's doing wonderful, just wonderful work. Uh, he uh, uh, broke the story that um, Emmanuel Toto Constant, uh, who had been teaching on uh, liberation theology in the National Intelligence Service, known as SIN, which the CIA, <laughs> which the CIA established in 86 or 87 as a national service to be used against the narcotics trade coming through Haiti and the Caribbean and that area. 
which in fact turned into a narcotics dealing organization, as they always do, or often do. But anyway, they'd set up sin, and uh, uh, Toto was teaching on liberation theology in sin. <laughs> How bad it was, naturally. It was sinful. And so uh, he then is asked by uh, the CIA and the DIA, uh, who are working together there. That's in the after, yes, that's theory. right. After, um, after the, um, the coup, to form a, uh, uh, a, let's say, a militant action force to balance the forces of Lavalas. That's the Aristide uh, political movement. And so they form the Front for Progress of Haiti or something like that. It's known as FRAP. Um, you, oh. you, you know, F R A P H. Yeah, frop in frop in, in, in yeah. yeah. And um, so anyway, they he organizes this uh, thing, and the CIA pays him to do it, and he's on payroll. They're paying the expenses, and meanwhile, these people are killing thousands, of, thousands of Haitians, all on Aristide's side, naturally. And uh, it was it, it was just as dirty as you can imagine. And there we were behind this, and this is covert action of the 1990s. I mean, it's not like like um, rigging an election or something. It's worse than that in terms of human cost. And um, uh, all this has come out thanks to the digging of, um, of Alan Nairn uh, and the publication of his uh, findings in The Nation magazine. Um, so Haiti uh, is one of those countries which um, the United States, uh, you know, it's like the rotten apple theory, you know. Um, Noam Chomsky talks about this all the time, you know. If you get one rotten apple in the barrel, you know, it's going to spread to all the others. And uh, so that's why they can't even allow a Haiti, as miserable as the country oh, is, terrible. to reorganize for social justice. It's, it's just, um, well, another eternal shame on the United States, I guess. But um, now that Aristide is back in, uh, they're probably doing everything they can to um, to defeat his forces, and it's not working, because in the elections that just were held, his his party or his organization won the parliament going away. Uh, they are in control of parliament now, and there will be a presidential presidential election coming up. Perhaps nobody seems to know because there's a possibility that he might take his extra three years, you know, and stay on. So the decision hasn't been made yet. But um, I, I think the uh, CIA is going to stay in there in Haiti. They're going to stay in Mexico. They're going to do what they always did. Communism never really was the problem, you know. No. It was never the problem in Cuba. It did become a problem when the United States, the Eisenhower administration, decided to overthrow the revolution and turn the clock back to the Batista days. Um, it did become a problem because then the Soviets got in there. They got a base and they got troops and missile crisis and all that. But that was in reaction. That was all in reaction to the United States' aggression toward Cuba, towards Cuba. And our installing yeah. uh, missiles all over the uh, world aimed at the Soviet yeah. Union. So I think that in the 1990s and beyond, we are going to see a lot more of this stuff uh, that we've known in the past. And one of the main reasons is that the United States is imposing this so-called neoliberal economic project. And that is uh, also goes under different names like free market and so forth. <laughs> but it, uh, it results without fail, and it's imposed by the IMF, you know, and by the United States bilaterally and World Bank and all of these organizations, w WTO, World Trade Organization now. And um, it is imposed, and it means in every single case the marginalization of a great mass of the society in a foreign country. These are, could be 10, 20, 40 percent of the population who are redundant. They're not needed. They're superfluous because the industry that develops and all the um, economic development leaves these people aside, just like that is happening now in the United States and is one of the reasons why the extreme right movement in the United States is growing so fast. But uh, that means that there's going to be resistance. And there will be people out there organizing, like the Zapatistas, for example, and others in Mexico, organizing to resist. And that means that there's a role for the CIA, mm -hmm. just like there was when, uh, when guerrillas were operating in Bolivia or uh, wherever. There's a role for the CIA to collect intelligence on them, to penetrate them, divide, weaken, and destroy these forces. And so we're going to see this, uh, I think, just like in the past. The communist menace was a bogey anyway in Latin America and lots of other places. Um, and just look at what has happened with the communist countries. Take China, big trading partner now. Vietnam, 
They're getting in there to try to tap that 78 million person market. And uh, they'll be doing it eventually with Cuba. But Cuba is special. They don't want to lose the idea of control in Cuba. And you have these Cuban exiles here, the Jorge Masas of the day, who want to go in there and run the country. Mm -hmm. Take the Burger King and the McDonald's franchise. <laughs> <laughs> and everywhere they go, you just tick off a list of these countries that have been subjected to CIA covert actions, and you can just see the the uh, trail of blood and, and just horrible things that have happened to the people and the economy. You look at Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, Haiti, Vietnam, uh, well, uh, Afghanistan. Oh, Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan is absolute, absolute <coughs> chaos mess. The, uh, what you call in Spanish, sequela, the aftermath of, um, of the Afghan intervention is uh, uh, still going on today. You read about it in the paper every single day, and the numbers of people there have been killed are astronomical. The numbers of refugees is way up there in the millions, and um, all because of a movement which took control in the country back in the, um, in the 80s and which was going to modernize Afghanistan. They were going to uh, change the status of women, who until that time were men's chattels. They were going to educate women to read and write. And uh, Afghanistan at that time was, uh, was living in the past uh, with just a few core sectors, you know, which had the education in the West and so forth. And uh, the um, agency got in there uh, with the Chinese and the Pakistanis um, trying to support the opposition to this social development program uh, before the communists took over in Afghanistan and before the Soviets intervened. But what is interesting to me is in the aftermath how many of these Arab volunteers, uh, Afghanistan is not an Arab country, but they had a lot of volunteers, uh, Islamic fundamentalists from the Arab countries uh -huh. who went as volunteers to fight in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, they were, they, they, they were volunteers from Algeria, from Morocco, from all of North Africa, Egypt too, Sudan, and uh, other Arab countries, and they went there as volunteers, and they fought. Uh, first, they were trained in, um, in how to handle the weapons and so forth uh, by, in these camps provided by the CIA. And uh, then they saw action on the front lines. Well, when it was over, these, uh, they're called Afghanis in their home countries because they'd gone off oh. to, as volunteers, even though they're from Arab countries. So these Afghanis, uh, so-called Afghanis, they went back and then they started to foment fundamentalist revolution in their own country. So you see what's happening in Egypt or in Algeria right now. This Algerian civil war has oh, yeah. taken 30, 35,000 lives, they say. But this is being run and some of the main forces there have served in Afghanistan uh, uh, with the bill ticket from the CIA and the training and so forth. Uh, same thing in Egypt with the um, uh, so-called Islamic group there. And of these people who were tried in New York, uh, f on the two cases, you know, one the World Trade Center bombing and the other the conspiracy trial for the tunnels in the, you know. Uh, I, I think half of those were trained in Afghanistan. So you see it coming home to roost. This is a typical boomerang, boomerang effect. The other one is uh, from Afghanistan is um, uh, the great missile buyback. You know about that one? No. Well. In the uh, early 80s, the CIA gave about 1,000 Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen. Those were the anti-communist forces backed by the United States and Pakistan and so forth. Um, they used about, I think they used about um, 250 of them. So there were 750 left over. And those are pretty sophisticated. Well, they are shoulder-fired, yeah. heat-seeking, and they were the missiles that, that turned the balance against the Soviets, or that has made the cost so high in terms of lost helicopters and jets and so forth that they had second thoughts about continuing in Afghanistan. It was very effective. But they only used about 250 of them, I think. Is, that's the figure that sticks in my mind. I've got it on, on paper somewhere. But um, that meant is, there were 750 left to get back. And naturally, the agency said, uh, we'll take things back, thank you. And the Afghanis said, mm-mm. We're keeping them together. <laughs> and so they disappeared. <laughs> and uh, Bush, when he was president, I think it was 91, 90, 91, maybe both years, he had to take uh, tens of millions of dollars from his special contingency fund and give it to the CIA for buying them back in the arms bazaars all over the place out there, 
where they were selling them. They know that the Iranians got some. And the, the thought, of course, is the danger and the threat is that they're going to shoot down an American airliner or two with these, with these missiles. And uh, so then, uh, then um, Carter, not, no, not Carter, but Clinton, I'm getting my presidents mixed up. Clinton... Uh, they're, all, they're all the same, spying <laughs> this bastard. <laughs> uh, uh, Clinton, uh, then in the summer of his first year in office, which would have been 93, uh, he also had to put up 40 million or something like that uh, to, the, to give the CIA, especially to buy back these missiles. And it's, it, I haven't read yet how many they've been able to buy back, but they've got their people running around from one market to another to another trying to, trying to get in as many as possible. And that's the sort of sort of thing you run into when you get involved with these these kinds of people. Mm. Um, I don't think they'll ever th probably get them all back because some are in the hands of the Iranians. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, if they were so naive naive as to think they could go to these mujahideen in Afghanistan, hi fellas, uh, we'll take the missiles back. Um, would you please? Uh, as a final question, uh, people say, well, we need the CIA. Other people say we don't need the CIA. Some people say, well, the CIA should be disbanded because its uh, hands are so bloody, but we do need to replace it with something else. What's your opinion on the need for an intelligence agency? Well, first let me say that you know there are committees uh, on different levels looking into the current and future role of the whole United States intelligence community because there's something like 12 organizations of which the CIA is only one and they spend 28 billion dollars I think is the accepted figure for the overall community budget of which the CIA gets about three billion and so there's a lot of money involved and there is a joint White House Senate committee which Les Aspen was heading until he died uh, they are to report in the coming months I think the House of Representatives has another committee going on it Groups outside government, like the 20th Century Fund, are also making their own studies, think tanks, in other words. And so <coughs> it's, a, it's a period of transition, and um, they are trying to come up with what uh, the structure and the uh, missions of the intelligence organizations should be. And uh, I think it's realistic to, uh, to say that, yes, we do need an intelligence service of some sort. There are legitimate targets out there which have to be... Um, have to be taken into account. I'm thinking of international terrorism, I'm thinking of the international narcotics trade, I'm thinking of the problem of the proliferation of nucle uh, nuclear weapons and chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction, in other words, and uh, uh, others. So I think that there is uh, certainly a need for an intelligence service and organization, no matter what you call it. Uh, it doesn't have to be called the CIA. And the Moynihan plan of dividing the CIA between the Pentagon and the State Department, that still could could be a solution, but we'll still have to have some clandestine collection. And the point all these years has been to use intelligence collection to prevent war, especially by, uh, by accident or miscalculation. And that was very important with the Soviet standoff, you know. Well, uh, I think that um, the most important things that should be changed, and I don't have any hope right now of changing these things, but uh, the most egregious activities are the subversion and overthrow of democratically elected civilian governments and their replacement with military dictatorships of the highly repressive type that institutionalize torture and disappear people and so forth. Uh, that is one thing that we should really try to eliminate because it's a disgrace on the United States. The CIA's support to murderous security services around the world is another area that really should be looked into. And these most recent revelations on Guatemala and the CIA connections with the murderers of uh, the American Michael Devine and the, the husband of uh, Jennifer Harbury, the American lawyer, that is indication that these types of support to these security services continuing. And uh, it, it was happening from the 50s on. I was involved in those, uh, those activities myself in the 60s. Those have got to be stopped. And um, um, then the... I would say the, um, the third area that really should be looked into is the general area of covered intervention in the affairs of other countries. Mm. And not just to overthrow, but to, to try to control and manipulate their institutions of power, whether it be the press or whether it be women's organizations or whatever. And so these are my, this is my wish list, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I don't have the slightest uh, hope that it's going to happen because I think that all of these CIA activities are a product of the domestic system in the United States. 
And until we change the domestic system in the United States, uh, reordering the power structure here, then these things are going to go on because they are needed by a very few in this country, few and powerful interests. And uh, they relate very closely to the operations of multinationals abroad, U.S.-based multinationals abroad. But it is a period of transition right now uh, in the world at large. It is the largest and the most important period of transition since the late 1940s and the early 50s. Uh, it's only a window of opportunity. Decisions are going to be made now about the use of the intelligence services and a lot of other international priorities and domestic priorities in the United States. And I think that everybody who is concerned should be involved in this, but not alone, in concert with others. Because an individual, as in the trade union movement, you know, an individual worker has no power at all. He can be fired and replaced at will. But if uh, you workers unite and a trade union in, with strength, then they have power. And the same thing goes in the political scene or a cultural scene or whatever else um, uh, other sec sector you may speak of. And so that is why it's so important for people to be involved uh, in groups, the group of choice. And there are many activities out there to be engaged in, such as solidarity with Cuba to try to break down that blockade of 35 years, or with Guatemala. So uh, there is something out there for everyone, and um, um, we only have ourselves to blame if we don't take action now. On our next Alternative Views, we'll hear the concluding hour of our two-part series of our interview with former CIA officer Phil Agee. We urge you to join us. It's going to be fascinating. But that brings us to the end of this hour of Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on alternative views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped self addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas 78713. You must send a self addressed stamped envelope. We would like to acknowledge the assistance of the people that helped us make our program possible. Jamie Otis is making a documentary about the CIA. This film features uh, Phil Agee in it. And uh, Jamie's the one who was the facilitator for getting us our interview with Phil Agee. The Texas Student Television Group provided the facilities and the crew. We really appreciate the help of our director, Steve Kahn, he was assisted by his technical director, Marty Harris. The camera people were Tony Brumer, Sabrina Tubio, and Tommy Kaiser. We also appreciate the help of Don Cooper, who was the escort for Philip A.G. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. So that's our address if you'd like to write to us. And be sure to join us on our next program when we have the concluding hour in our two-part series of an interview with ex-CIA officer Phil Agee. Goodbye. <laughs>